Okay, good evening, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, thank you for everybody who has joined us from around the world. Uh, we often get uh, lists of all the different countries that are joining us, and it's always amazing and exciting and humbling uh, to see all the participants around the world tuning in to see what we have to say about uh, shoulder surgery. So tonight, I have a great uh, um, faculty here to talk about failed instability surgeries and what to do with them. So uh, myself, uh, Eamon Ferry, I'm in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona at Arizona Sports Medicine Center. We're also joined by Dr. Amir Moinfar. He is with Elite Orthopedic and Musculoskeletal Center. He is a clinical assistant professor at the Par Department of Orthopedics at the University of Maryland. Um, and so we're very happy to have Dr. Moinfar. Dr. Scott Sigmund is the team physician of UMass Lowell. He is also the host of the Ortho Show podcast. If you guys haven't tuned in for that podcast, you have to check it out. He has very exciting and entertaining uh, participants, including myself, um, and it's really something to check out. He's also the CMO and founder of Ortho Laser, an exciting new venture uh, using lasers to treat musculoskeletal injuries. He's also a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, and he is out of the Boston area. So these are our disclosures. So a little bit about AO North America. It's an independent nonprofit surgical specialty society dedicated to improving the care of patients with musculoskeletal injuries. We do not endorse nor promote the use of any product or service or commercial entities. The equipment used in this course is for demonstration and teaching purposes only with the intent to enhance the learning experience. So I wanted to give you a little background. I think most of us are familiar with AO um, you know, out of Switzerland as primarily a trauma-based teaching uh, institution. Um, they do a lot of other things. There's, you know, recon and spine and uh, facial stuff as well. I wanted to let you know we started a new initiative within the AO family called the Sports Initiative. And specifically what we're talking about tonight is obviously on the sports shoulder side. So with AO Sports, we're going to focus primarily on joint disorders with soft tissue, arthroscopy and arthroscopic surgery, sports medicine, and really focus largely on shoulder and knee pathologies. So this just started up about 2020. So we're getting going. So keep your eye open, keep watching the, uh, the website on AO and see for other events that we have in the future. Uh, in the past, we have done three webinars. Uh, these are all in the fall of 2020. Uh, and these were basic background type lectures looking at injuries, the long and biceps tendon, rotator cuff and glenohumeral instability. Um, I did this along with the two other co-chairs uh, Dr. Martin Yeager, who is out of Freiburg, Germany, and Dr. Shi Chen, who is in Shanghai, China. So we started this off. These are all on the AO uh, website. So if you want to see them, you know, log in there. They're really good, nice discussions of these different pathologies. Uh, we did another North America-based uh, webinar back in January. Um, had a great faculty there, Dr. Bechet out of Detroit, Dr. Favorito uh, in Cincinnati, and, and Dr. Ponce out of the Houston Clinic. Um, we talked about how to treat massive rotator cuff tears. So we talked about SCRs and lower trap transfers and revision surgeries with patches and grafts. So if that's something you're interested in, that's also online and you can go back and check that out. Um, obviously tonight we're talking about instability. We have one more webinar uh, next month in June. So if you're available, same time, June 15th, we're gonna talk about failed rotator cuff repairs and how to manage these with either a vision repair or a subacromial balloon. Um, so there's a link to the registration. So if you have your phone, take a picture of that and then click on it and that will take you into the AO North America registration page. If not, you can always just Google it and it will get you there as well. I'm very happy to announce that we have an actual in-person course scheduled for this fall. It's going to be September 24th, 25th. So that's a Saturday and a Sunday in Boston, Massachusetts. This is gonna be a really exceptional course. We have international faculty, true to AO standards. We're gonna bring in the experts from America, from uh, Europe and uh, talk about different shoulder pathologies and how to treat them. It's gonna be a small group, right? So we have a small group discussion on the first day with uh, two faculty per station with five or six participants. And it's gonna be primarily case-based. The second day is gonna be in the lab and that's where we're gonna get um, opportunity for hands-on uh, practice surgeries on the cadavers. Um, I'll be one of the chairs as well as uh, Dr. Jaeger out of Germany. Um, so far, this is our faculty. Again, the folks that have been helping us out with the webinars, they will also be your faculty at the course. So you're getting a little bit of a preview of uh, with these webinars with who will be working at the course. Uh, one other thing I mentioned, the, uh, the QR code 
for the courses right there. So uh, take a picture of that if you're interested in learning more about the course um, on the AO website. So we talked about day one. I am happy to also announce that this will be happening concurrently with the OSET meeting in Boston. It will be at the Encore Hotel, a beautiful new hotel uh, in Boston. Um, and we'll be working there um, on day one with the small group discussions, again, talking about shoulder instability, slap and biceps injuries, rotator cuff tears. And we built in a lot of time for open discussion. And like tonight, we want this to be a very open discussion amongst faculty, amongst the participants. We want to really get in depth in talking about the different shoulder pathologies that we're treating and how we're treating them. On day two, again, this is the cadaveric lab. You're going to have the opportunity to do anything you want to do in the shoulder, sports related, bank arch slaps, cuffs, ladder jays, whatever you want to do. We're going to be able to do that down in Arena. So why should you attend the, uh, the, the course? Well, again, we talked about small group discussions. We have international thought leaders uh, who will be present as faculty. We have a hands-on lab. There's additional time for open dissections and discussing open procedures. You do Aaron CME for this course if you need it. Um, it also gives you a chance to check out OSET. So because the meeting is at OSET, the, the first day of our course on Saturday, um, you also have the opportunity to uh, go and check out any of the lectures and uh, events through OSET on that date. And you'll have it, a, a, uh, if you want to spend the rest of the time at the OSET meeting on the days previous to this, you also get a reduced um, uh, tuition for that. So check out for that with, with more information to come. Um, there's also a principal's course. So if you say, I'm not quite ready for a master's course, but I want to learn more about arthroscopic procedures and fixation strategies and the principles of arthroscopy, uh, this is going to be a great course for you. Um, this is going to be in uh, Denver, Colorado in August. I mean, who doesn't want to be in Denver in August? It's a beautiful time of year there. 19th and 20th. Again, the QR code is there for you if you want to check it out. Uh, doctors uh, Standard and Sherman out of Missouri and Stanford, uh, respectively, will be your co-chairs for that course. So this is a Zoom course. So Zoom etiquette, all microphones and videos have been turned off except for ours. Um, if you have questions, please, please, please ask them or technical issues. Do that through the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. So Dr. Moinfar will be managing that. So during the talks um, for things he can respond to quickly, he will do so. If there are things he needs to interrupt us for, he will do so. And there's plenty of time built in between cases at the end. We can have a real discussion about the questions that come in about the topics that we're discussing. Um, where there's a chat box, it turned off for you guys, it's only for us. So a little overview about what we're gonna do tonight. This webinar is designed to discuss and identify approaches to managing a patient with a failed instability surgery. So with this, we hope that you will be able to gain a better understanding of the process from revision repair to arthroscopic glenoid reconstruction with the distal tibial allograft. The case presentations will illustrate the options in managing the situation, both surgically and non-surgically, and hopefully help you develop the ability to create and execute the appropriate surgical plan. At the end of this, we hope that you will be able to recognize why the labor repair failed, know the options for managing the situation both surgically and non-surgically, and be able to create and execute an appropriate surgical plan. Here's our agenda. So right now I'm giving the introduction. I got a case for you. We'll spend about 20 minutes on that. Then we'll have about five minutes during transition for questions and answers and discussion. Uh, Dr. Sigmund will give his case starting about 8.30, again, 20 minutes for that, give or take. We'll have question and answer at the end, another 10 minutes. And at nine o'clock, we'll start wrapping things up and uh, finish off any questions. So with that, I will load my case. Okay, so this is a 23-year-old right-hand dominant male. He presented to me with a history of right shoulder instability. About two years prior to seeing me, he did have a, what he called a drug-related seizure and had to go to the emergency room for reduction. So we talk about shoulder instability. One important thing for me is what are they calling instability? Is this the shoulder shifting around and they're reducing it themselves? Or are they actually having to go to the emergency room to get it redu reduced? Or if they're an athlete, are they doing it on, the, you know, is there a trainer doing it on the field? So this type of history I find appropriate to really understanding how bad the instability is. He did have a surgery on that shoulder. Uh, it was uh, several months before seeing me. Um, this was in November of 2018. This was done at, a, at another facility by another doctor. He then had another drug-related seizure in June of 2019. He went back to the ER and again, had to have it closed reduced in the ER. At this point, he presents to me uh, in 2019 with 
uh, pain and the fact that he, quote, can't trust his shoulder. He hadn't had any further dislocation since the one in June, uh, but he wants to be active. He's a young guy. He wants to play sports, and he's very worried about his uh, shoulder. So his physical exam, this was October of 2019, so uh, not quite a year after his surgery. He had full range of motion. He did have quite a bit of inst anterior instability to load shift maneuver. Apprehension and relocation were both positive. He had good strength and otherwise neurologically intact. I apologize. I do not have the x-rays for him, but no um, obviously fractures, no significant degenerative changes. He did have a little hill sacs lesion uh, that was visible. I was able to get his uh, preoperative MRI. So this is prior to the other surgeon doing the surgery. Um, these were performed about a year prior to me seeing him. So on these, you can see on these uh, axial views, um, you can see a, an alpso type lesion here, a uh, little hill sacs here, uh, but really not a ton of bone loss on the glenoid. Um, so with this, um, now he's seen you. He's had surgery since that MRI. X-rays show a little health sacs. He's had a documented instability event. Uh, Scott, uh, what are you what are you doing next for this guy? Let me come off mute. There we go. Um, yeah. yeah. So, sorry. so we'll, we'll give him one. We'll give him yeah. Give him a second seconds. to get the yeah, audience yeah, to together get there for sure. Yeah. So we want to see what you guys have to say. So we have audience participation here. And so um, while we're thinking about what we're going to do, you guys plug it in there. And then uh, Scott, tell us what your thoughts are. Yeah, so uh, anytime there's previous uh, uh, shoulder instability surgery, I'm going to worry about critical bone loss of the glenoid. So uh, I think an MRI is, is a good tool for that, but I'm not so sure that it gives you a, a really accurate read. Uh, so I'm a big fan of looking at a CT scan in a patient like this. Uh, I think a repeat MRI is going to be indicated as well because of previous surgery. I want to know. Uh, where his anchors are, what the labrum is really, you know, looking like at this point and, and what's been done since that surgical intervention. So in this case in particular, where there's been previous surgery, I'm probably going to go with C and do both studies. Well, the MRI and CT. Okay. So um, I'd say it's looking at our audience. Uh, a lot of people want MRIs and about a quarter want the MRI and CT. So they would agree with you. Um, I just got the MRI. So a uh, few uh, weeks after seeing him, so this is the end of 2019, October, um, you can see here, uh, Amir, what do you think about this MRI? Yeah, so a, a quick step back, I think you bring up a good point. So I personally would just go with MRI, the main reason being you mentioned on the x-ray analysis, you didn't see much bone loss. Um, if you had seen much bone loss on the um, x-ray, I would have agreed with CT uh, or CT modality. But if you can go MR arthrogram or 3T MRI, which you've done, um, then I'm comfortable with that. So I see a few things. Obviously, he's got a, you know, a, a, a hill stacks, I'd say maybe like 20, 20%. 20 um, also, he's obviously got still evidence of a bank heart lesion. His anchors, you know, he's got three anchors, which are, to me, I, I seem extraordinarily high. I mean, you know, one is at the equator and the rest are in, the, in no man's land, which I tell the residents, nothing should really go in there, that anterior superior quadrant. Um, so, but fortunately, no appreciable bone loss. And fortunately for you, Eamon, you, you can you can play miss an anchor hole, you know, because there's not much, which <laughs> the money is down there. Um, but that's that's kind of, you know, what I see on that in a nutshell. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And so when we go back, we can see Hill Sachs has definitely gotten a little bit bigger. And I would agree, you're looking about 20, 25% bone loss. So for me, this is significant uh, Hill Sachs and certainly would can be considered an off-track Hill Sachs lesion. Uh, you can see he's only one anchor, uh, at least that we can see on this study, uh, fixing his, his hill, uh, his, uh, looks like he had a remplissage. And so he had one anchor in that hill sac lesion for the remplissage. It does not look like the remplissage healed, given the amount of bone edema still around there and, and those pictures in the bottom corner. But I think the real take home, and, and you, you touched on this perfectly, is the location of the anchors. Um, and I think this is a real take home point here. When you look at somebody who has had failed surgery that you did not do, go in there and try and figure out why it failed. Look at what they did and how they did it, and if you would do it any differently. And these anchors are basically at, uh, you know, twelve o'clock, and then one o'clock, and three o'clock. So completely missed where the tear is, which is typically that three to six o'clock position. So right away, I'm thinking technically this surgery could have been done better. So we have a big heart to heart. Um, he had uh, drug-related seizures from cocaine use. 
Um, and so I said, you know, you got to be clean. Let's get you into a neurologist, um, have them, you know, sort of give you their blessing and make sure that there's no other underlying factors that are uh, contributing to your seizure disorder. Because for me, that's an important thing. Uh, if you have seizures in the early postoperative period, you can rip everything out and then you're really in trouble. Uh, how do you guys like to manage those, uh, Scott? I'm sorry, one more time. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. For um, you know, patients with seizure disorders and shoulder instability. Yeah, I mean that's it's a big issue. I, I think that uh, you know this is a gentleman that's that has drug related seizures. Um, so I think your your analysis and, and process is perfect. Trying to make make sure that he he stays off. But all, as we all know, the experience with opioids is that you really can't guarantee that they're going to stay off, regardless of what we provide them. You really have to make sure that your fixation and your surgical strategy is going to work to hopefully maintain that that instability pattern. Now, for a patient that's uh, that is seizure dependent, that is not related necessarily to drugs. Uh, again, I think really making sure that you have solid fixation uh, to make sure that you're not going to have an instability pattern. I, you know, it's funny with this case, Amen. It sort of almost reminds me of ACL surgery when you go to revisions, right? And, and depending on who's done the surgery and where the mm -hmm. bone tunnels are, uh, oftentimes what is labeled as a revision surgery turns out to be a lot like a primary surgery yep. because you're putting stuff where it needs to go. This is a, this is a vertical tunnel right here. That's, yes, a, exactly. that's a good analogy. Yeah, so I completely agree. So for me, you know, I want to see them six months seizure free. Uh, for this guy, you know, obviously he had a very specific reason why he was having surgeries. But for my patients who have seizures for other medical reasons, I want to see them on a stable dose of whatever medication they're on uh, for six months with being seizure free. And we have a real, you know, big conversation about that being very important for their uh, post-operative recovery. So if who I did may that? chime in, if I yeah, may please. chime in, too. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think two points that I'd make on that is for me, as, as Scott um, Siggy touched on, if someone's got really seizure disorder not associated with any um, illicit drug use, I let the neurologist handle all that. I make sure their levels are normal. And I make them actually do a formal clearance to say this person has been medically optimized, um, that their levels are appropriate, the levels are therapeutic. Um, if, however, it is um, drug related, I actually send those patients to pain management. Um, and I do that for two reasons. One is I want them to do the toxicology screen, manage all that. I want to make sure that they're doing all that. And a lot of those patients, despite multimodal pain therapy, they may have some pain issues post-op and I'd and I, and I like to have those people on board. So that's where mm -hmm. I do separate the, in terms of where I go preoperatively based on the etiology of the seizures. All right, very good point. Yeah, so uh, to your point, I did send them to the neurologist. They did a brain M MRI and EEG and labs and everything was normal. Neurologist came back, said this was strictly a cocaine withdrawal seizure. There's no need to medicate, uh, no need to do anything differently. And so, again, we had a real heart to heart about him not doing cocaine anymore, at least not until his shoulder is well healed. And uh, he agreed to that. So what do we do now, Amir? Let's say give the folks uh, 15 seconds to, to chime in and let's see where you would take this guy. Okay. What do you think, Amir? Um, so, you know, one thing I tell the residents, I say before we get to the sexy part of the surgery, make sure you have your pre-op planning set up. For me, part of that's to be really the operative note. Um, I want to make sure I know what, what kind of anchors were put in, what kind of biomaterial it was. I want to know um, what I'm potentially looking at in terms of intraoperative findings, make sure I have everything lined up. Um, but I think just, you know, assuming the diagnostic arthroscopy and the EUA um, correlate, I think a bank heart repair with rompelisage um, is going to be the right way to go. Um, unless, unless I'm really surprised by uh, intraoperative um, glenoid um, bone loss, which I don't anticipate. So I would go with B. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any role? I mean, nobody chose non-operative management, so we're all here on the same page. But I mean, what do you guys think? Any role for further non-operative management in this active guy? Therapy is not really going to work. I know, Siggy, you want to hit him with a laser? Yeah, no, you know, it's <laughs> funny. There's a, there's a really good paper that just came out by Rob Meislin out of uh, NYU Langone, which took a look at the results of an arthroscopic bank art with remplissage versus you know, Rob does arthroscopic ladder J uh, and the outcomes were, were quite similar. And so, uh, you know, really quite fascinating depending on, on, on 
what your background is and, and, and what you're good at. You know, an arthroscopic ladder J or an open ladder J in this patient could actually provide good outcome as well. Uh, I think the issue, and, and Rob pointed out in his paper, is that they didn't really address, you know, critical bone loss of the glenoid. And that's really the, the key, right? I think an arthroscopic Bancard and Remplissage, uh, if you're going to, to, if you will, put a parachute on the humeral head to prevent it from going forwards mm -hmm. or doing a ladder J to extend the track so that you don't have dislocation. Both of those can work, you know, really quite well, depending on the extent of that bone loss. Perfect. Okay. So this is the view for once we got in the shoulder. So you can see, you know, posterior viewing portal looking anteriorly. So that uh, first uh, picture up here on the upper left uh, corner, you can see one suture there. And again, consistent with the MRI, that's up around one o'clock. Um, still some tearing, some sutures there you can see on the upper right. Really, ALPSA, you know, anterior, inferior, glenoid, labrum. Um, so no major bone loss, but there was no labral tissue there. And there's a view on the bottom right. That was his hill sacs lesion. You can see there's some sutures in there and something green. Maybe that was a cannula or who knows what that was embedded in the bone, but clearly his <laughs> remplissage did not heal. So one other thing I like to do is get that bird's eye view. So I switch the camera to the anterior superior portal. I kind of look backwards and down and I kind of get that view. You can see, you know, the glenoid there um, and see where his resting position is. And that was his resting position. So clearly an off track um, uh, hill sacs lesion. And that's, you know, pretty good size one. So after seeing all of this, Scott, are you going to change? I know you love doing arthroscopic ladder J's and, you know, we're going to talk about some really sexy glenoid reconstructions. Um, you know, looking at these pictures, does that change anything for you? Yeah, no, I, I, I think the message that I would have is that if you're really good, if you're a good arthroscopic bank card and run passage dude, uh, and you don't do a lot of ladder J, I think that this is a very good indication for that operation. If you're a good ladder J, whether it's arthroscopic ladder J, you can make a strong argument because of the engaging hill sacs here by increasing the glenoid track that you're gonna be able to help to, to, to have that stay. So, you know, be good at what you do, mm -hmm. certainly, you know, and if you're not, then come join us uh, at OSET where we can really sit down with you <laughs> and really learn some new techniques together. Perfect. Love the plug. All right, do we have the results on the, there we go. Okay, uh, so we've got a few more people moving into the uh, Ladder J camp. Went from about, so almost doubled. Okay, all right, good. Hey, Amen, right. if I may chime in on, on Yeah, that. please. Uh, so, uh, you know, Siggy and I, we both went to Sao Paulo and Cincinnati to learn ArthroJet together. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the only difference that I have, and I say Siggy's a brother from another mother, the only the only thing that I say about this is I, I'm, I'm fond of the latter J as well, but I, I'm a little bit hesitant in this situation because no offense to anybody, because I may have these people floating around, but because the index surgery wasn't technically done correctly, I, and I'd like to give a chance for the procedure to have been done correctly. Mm -hmm. And then potentially if it fails, then your latter J is an option. I think if this had failed and the and the anchors were in the appropriate position, or for instance, you know, um, the remplissage had healed, then I think your next natural step for me in the algorithm is ladder J. But because the index procedure technically doesn't appear to have been done soundly, that's why I would give a chance in terms of I don't even want to say a revision because the index one wasn't really right a, a bank perfect. card to begin with. If that makes sense. No, that's absolutely perfect. Yeah, thank you for that point, and that's a really good learning point from this case is that you know, understanding why the, the surgery failed can help you pick the next best surgery. And I completely agree with your thoughts. If you felt like the first surgery had gone well and everything was done appropriately, um, then that may change what you do at this point. So, okay. So um, one of the things I like to do, so obviously I did a bank heart with the remplissage. One of the things I like to do for my remplissage is I place my humeral head anchors first. Um, and I like to use double loaded suture anchors as you can see there on the left. And one of the reasons why I place those first is that allows me or my assistant to pull on the suture anchors and get the head out of the way uh, during, the, uh, during the labral portion of the surgery. So it gives you a little extra traction um, to get the head out of the way, as you can see there, the picture on the right, that's um, with the you know, tension on the sutures. And you can see how the infraspinatus nicely tucks uh, into that hill sacs lesion. So here's a view on the left there, um, kind of that bird's eye view looking down. 
So we're really gonna mobilize the, that labor. I'm gonna just wanna show a quick video because I feel like this is one of the most important steps in any bank heart repair is getting proper labral mobilization. And oftentimes you can't see it. So you gotta go down there and you gotta find it. And sometimes you go to that anterior superior portal to view down and see it. But here I'm using a tissue liberator and I'm going right along the scapular neck. So the anterior aspect of the glenoid and I'm getting deep. I'm going down all the way to subscap and I'm just tra pulling traction on that labrum and the capsule capsular tissues. So you know you've done enough mobilization when two things. One is that you can easily see the labrum and the capsule floating there. The other thing is you want to be able to flip your camera back into that anterior superior portal and look down and see the fibers of the subscap. That means you've completely released all the scar tissue, you've released all the adhesions, you've gotten that um, labrum and the capsule fully mobilized from the anterior scapula. And that's really where your sweet spot is as far as getting these fixed. And once you see that, then you know you're ready to start placing your anchors and start your fixation. So uh, after we're done, I did uh, three anchors here. So three to 530 on the clock face. Um, you can see it kind of brought the capsule and labrum back up to the face of the glenoid. Um, and uh, for this, I'm using non-absorbable sutures. Uh, for the uh, pre and post for the hill sacs, you can see there's the hill sacs lesion. This is after, again, resting position. Uh, you can see the sutures there on the bottom right and that picture on the right. And now we've got the humeral head uh, recentered on the glenoid um, after tying the, uh, you know, passing and tying the sutures for the REM plissage. So, uh, you know, uh, see, so talked about, you know, uh, previous surgery looking at bank arts and uh, REM plissage versus arthroscopic letter J. Here is a uh, level one randomized study looking at bank hearts with hill sacs lesions. So eight to 25% of the humeral head bone loss with minimal glenoid bone loss, which they defined as less than 15%. So two groups here, one got a REM plissage, uh, sorry, bank heart with REM plissage, one got a bank heart without a REM plissage. Mean follow-up of more than two years, really nice study. I mean, you look at this, 18% a redislocation. So this wasn't just re-instability. I felt my shoulder slipped out. These were true documented dislocations. 18% um, within the first two years in the no REM plissage group versus 4% in the REM plissage group. So really a very significant difference uh, in the redislocation rate. Uh, if you look at outcome measures and post-op range motion, um, for those that did not redislocate, really no difference uh, in the two. So really it was uh, redislocation, which determined how well you did afterwards, but that was significantly higher than the no uh, REM plissage group. So if you see these patients, um, like we're, you know, uh, presenting here, um, if you don't do that REM plissage, you get a significant increased risk of redislocation um, without that REM plissage. All right. And that is all that I have. All right. Um, so I guess we're going to switch over. So I guess uh, for a couple minutes, Siggy, Siggy, we're switching over. Um, let's see, there's one question. Um, it says, do you use three millimeters of depth? and or 19 millimeters of length of the hill sacs as your threshold for rump massage. So the question that's being asked from Benjamin Donahue is essentially, as I'm understanding, is how do you measure your hill sacs and how do you convert that, I guess, into a percentage and what's your threshold is what procedure you do for the, hip, for the defect? Amen, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I, I don't, I wouldn't say I actually take the time to measure them. Um, when I'm looking at them on the uh, preoperative imaging, whether MRI or CT scan, um, you know, I'm looking at these as, you know, small, less than 10 to 20%, larger ones in that 20 to 30%, and then the really big ones, you know, greater than 40%. Okay. So for the little ones, less than 10%, um, you know, those I'm often not doing anything. Those most typically are going to be your on-track hill sac lesions. So they're not going to be engaging in normal range of motion of shoulder uh, motion. Uh, and, and this is assuming, you know, no significant glenoid bone loss. Okay, so I'm gonna do a, a little game I like. Yes, no, rapid fire. You gotta just give me an answer. So, Eamon, uh, double, uh, double stranded horizontal mattress or single stranded? What's your go-to for a bank card standard? A uh, single. Siggy. Uh, both, down low, single. As I get up for higher on the clock, I go horizontal. Next question. Uh, like to tie sutures or knotless? Eamon. Tie. Siggy. Uh, I'm a liger guy. <laughs> so oh my god there okay. is there <laughs> so, no there is a suture anchor developed by a company 
that is a sliding suture that really doesn't have to make you tie knots. So it's somewhere in between. Okay, next question. Uh, all suture, suture anchor, yes or no in this situation? Amen. No. No. Sticky. All no. right, great. Sticky, you're up. Okay, shoulder instability, complex bony bank cart. Um, so clinical history, this is a 46-year-old right-hand dominant male, previous arthroscopic bank cart performed by myself uh, on the left shoulder with a, a good result, was out hiking, uh, fell down in the mountain, outstretched and re-dislocated his left shoulder. Uh, a concentric reduction had been performed elsewhere and then uh, presented uh, to my office uh, for evaluation. So let's just jump uh, right on in here. Um, uh, Eamon, do you think that this is a normal x-ray? You know, I know this is just an AP view, but what are you seeing on this view? Yeah, so uh, so this would be uh, pretty much a gracie view for me. You can see some joint line there. You know, the things that make me a little concerned is the uh, along the anterior inferior glenoid, I, you don't see that nice definition, that cortical margin of that anterior inferior glenoid. So for me, this is, if you don't see a well-defined uh, margin there, then that starts to make you worry that there's some, uh, maybe some bone injury along that anterior inferior glenoid. And plus, uh, when you're looking at the proximal humerus, you know, you see a little outline of maybe some uh, sclerosis along the, what would be the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity that makes you think, yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe there's some trauma there. And in the history of instability, I'd worry about a Hill-Sachs lesion there. Yeah, and Amir, you have anything to add? Um, usually when I see this, going to your next question, I'm, I'm less excited about MRI and more excited about some CT modality when I see this. Okay, good. So really what, what Amin was referring to is right here in this area in here, on a normal x-ray, now I know that this is sort of a picture image, but you really do see a nice subchondral bone complex that runs down the entire zone. And when it starts to fade out to this area in here, there should be a lot of suspicion for, for possible damage to the area. All right, so um, we're going to go ahead and pop the poll up here. Is that okay, guys? We have that? There we go. Uh, we'll let the audience to give us for a sec. Okay. Um, Eamon, what are you doing? What do you think? I, I would go uh, uh, five MRI and CT scan. Okay. <laughs> we should have had, that's right. That's a good yeah, we should have yeah. had that there. So, but, sure. uh, no, the point's well taken. So I think uh, for me, and kind of like we talked about in the last case, um, I like to see the MRI. I like to see what soft tissue has been da done, uh, damage has been done. It uh, gives you a, a little bit more indication of, you know, prior uh, anchor tracks um, and where the prior, you, know, you did this prior surgery. So, you know, it was done correctly, but it also helps you kind of see where that the soft tissue stands. But the, the 3D CT scan with humeral head subtraction, when you start thinking glenoid bone loss, you got to order it. It is super important. And I'll even on there for the radiologist, I'll even tell them, please, you know, measure for glenoid bone loss. So that they can give you a number. So I'm not fiddling around in, you know, in the middle of clinic trying to figure out, you know, my perfect circle on my 3D uh, reconstructed CT. But it really helps you get a good gestalt with that 3D reconstruction, hemorrhoid subtraction, looking at the, uh, the, the, the glenoid. And then the, the 3D CT obviously is the way to go. Amir? You're on mute. Sorry, I was answering questions in the, in the chat, in the Q&A. So, um, I prefer the 3D with the humeral head subtraction. Um, if that's not possible, CT scan. Um, but I do like the radiologist. I tell them to measure. But one question that I'll come up later, I also make my own measurements. We can discuss how that comes. But I like number three. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I think half the time that I order the 3D CT scan with humeral head subtraction, it winds up not having a humeral head subtraction. Then we have yeah. to call it back and they wind up doing it for us. Jorge yeah. Chala had a nice study. Uh, where he took a look at the measurements for the amount of bone loss associated with the, with the CT scan. And if you do your circle or oval technique, it's pretty good out to about 20%. Once you get beyond 20% bone loss, it may overcall it. Uh, but Eamon, I like your idea a lot. Those radiologists are really good at putting those circles and things. And more often than not, they're putting lines and circles in places I don't want it. So it's nice to actually have them do it where you do want it. Uh, so that's good. And then I know we have a lot of international uh, physicians on as well. And you may not be that your CT scan maybe has the ability to do so. So, you know, a burn, uh, Bernigal view is also really a nice way to be able to identify significant anterior bone loss associated with the glenoid. And it is validated uh, as a reasonable x-ray. So if everybody remembers 
the sort of you bring your arm over like this in this position, and then the x-ray comes in from the other side, I should say like this, and comes down like that, and then you can go and see. So you can Google it if you want to, but it is a nice way, uh, a, a poor man's ability to get a nice view of that anterior glenoid as well. Uh, so we certainly did go ahead and do a pre-op uh, CT humeral head subtraction, you can see here. Uh, this is an interesting case, right? Because, you know, when I've been growing up in children's instability, I was taught one thing and one thing only. Uh, bony bank cards, man, you fix them all. Get in there and get it fixed. But what are you guys thinking about this image? Remembering now that this patient has had a previous bank cart repair done by me, so I was pretty happy with it. He did well until he fell down a mountain. Uh, is there any concern about the quality of the bone, drill holes, stuff like that? What are you guys thinking? Yeah, uh, that's a, quite a big bony chunk. Um, do you remember what kind of anchors you used? Um, yeah, they were, they, they're obviously no metal, but it was, uh, you know, bi-absorbable anchors, yeah. medium, you know, regular size with, resorb, uh, with mostly uh, permanent suture. Okay, yeah, because I've seen a few of these. Um, primarily with the non-absorbable peak anchors uh, of years past, and then also a couple that actually have from uh, the all suture anchors. Um, they can leave quite a bit of cavitation, um, and it leaves like little postage stamp uh, glenoid fractures. They fracture right through the, the anchor holes. So yeah, no, I'd be very concerned about the quality of the bone there. I think, I think, yep. that, that, I think that piece, even if you keyed it in perfectly, which I don't think it would be possible, I think you've lost some bones. So I keep, even I look at it kind of like subacute kind of, you know, atrophic non-union kind of thing. I think even if you got that in there perfectly, and even if you use the ladder J tray to try to use it in there and secure it, I, I, I don't think you're going to eliminate all of that inverted pair or kind of that, that shape that you have there. So I, I wouldn't be too confident with trying to, trying to fixate that. Great points, guys. And I think that's really a take on point here, right? And that, you know, yeah, you want to try and fix it, but is this bone going to have poor quality? Are you going to be able to mobilize it? Are you going to be able to get it back in perfectly? And then are you going to be able to fix it, right? Because this is a large fragment. So those are all the things that I was thinking about as I'm trying to come up with a, a plan here as far as where we go for the next intervention. Um, so let's go ahead here. Yes, you know, we're, we're in the States and we ordered too many tests. So yeah, I went ahead and ordered an MRI too. You can see the imaging here as it pops on. You can see a fairly large piece of the bone and, you know, I would definitely call this critical bone loss. Are we okay with that, guys? Critical glenoid bone loss here. Uh, whether it's the, the percentages are changing on a daily basis, you know, used to be 25%, now it's down to 20%. Is it down to 17%? I think that, you know, Eamon, you made a really good point early on. And that is, you know, we don't treat MRIs and images. We also treat patients. And it's super important to get the history on these patients, right? If you have a patient that's got 15% bone loss that comes in and says to you, my shoulder dislocates when I sneeze, and I have dislocated no less than 20 times in my life, that's a patient I'm really going to be maybe pushing the envelope to say, well, maybe 15% is actually critical bone loss for that patient. Mm -hmm. So I think getting a really good history, understanding the, 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 the type of uh, instability pattern that the patient's having is important. All right, so here we go. Uh, I think we can jump right into another poll here uh, so we can discuss you know, what the options are here. We'll let everybody go ahead and, and, and pop in. All right, that should be pretty good. We'll go to Amir first. We're gonna switch it up a little bit. What do you like it? Um, you know, my, my concern is I'd like to get an intraoperative measurement of how much bone loss you have there. I have, I think it's gonna be more than you think. So I have some reservations about whether or not the, I didn't get a good look, first of all, on the sagittal, the coracoid, because I like to look at that too and see how much space that'll occupy. I have some reservations. You might be going down the DTA route on that, um, an allograft reconstruction. Um, but I, I, I would be I would be equipped to do a ladder J, but I have some worry about how much bone loss you have. I think it may be more than you think. So that's really a great point, right? A coracoid is a coracoid and it, it comes with the package. You yep. can't make it bigger or smaller. It is what it is. Yep. So if you're worried about extensive bone loss more than perhaps what the coracoid can manage for you, then you know certainly a bone grafting procedure is something to consider. Eamon? Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, looking at that MRI particularly, I mean, you're borderline, like, you know, there's a difference between a, the bony avulsion that we get with a typical bony bank heart which is usually, you know, somewhere in that 10% range. And then there's the glenoid fracture. 
And those are, in my experience, you know, 25% and more. Um, and you're, I think you're in that range of almost a glenoid fracture. And I would be very concerned, as Amir appropriately pointed out, um, if you try and move that coracoid process, you may just not have enough bone there. More than 25% uh, bone loss on that glenoid, um, uh, that's too much for me to do a ladder chair. So, I mean, I can tell you right now, when I got in there, that thing wasn't moving, even if I wanted to go, uh, have it go. So, you know, the plan was, sure, in a perfect world, if I can mobilize it and put it in, perhaps we might use the bone, but concern about the bone quality, all of those things, I was prepared to do a bony operation. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think our points here are very good for the amount of bone loss that we're looking at here. But I go back to a point that I always like to bring up, which is, you know, if, if you're good at doing an open ladder J and you can do that operation in an hour or 90 minutes, do you need to learn how to do an arthroscopic ladder J? Maybe you don't. Uh, I can tell you, I, I never learned how to do an open ladder J and I went straight to arthroscopic ladder J and it was a, it was a battle. Six months of my life, we traveled to, to, to La Fosse and, and Annecy. We went and saw Matt Ravenscroft in, in England. And then of course, Paul Favorito in Cincinnati where Amir joined us. Uh, and then, you know, it, it was a long haul. And I can tell you every single time I went to sleep the night before an arthroscopic ladder J, I wasn't sleeping because it's a hard operation and it took me a long time to master it. And so all of a sudden came out this anterior glenoid reconstruction with the distal tibial allograft with the Halifax portal that was really uh, championed by Ivan Wong in Halifax. And that really has opened up the door for me in really feeling like I have you know, the, the option of treating these patients with an easier operation that's much less technically demanding than an arthroscopic ladder J. Now, the argument is you don't have the sling effect. I understand that. But there's more and more studies coming out at this point uh, that are showing that, uh, that the sling may not be required. So certainly, you know, these are all the concerns that are sort of running through my brain as I'm trying to decide what intervention we're going to do. So sure enough, you know, that bone didn't move. Uh, I went ahead, took our time, really extensive time, you know, burring away to get that piece out of the way to make sure that we had an adequate visualization. And we went ahead and did a distal tibial allograft for this patient. So instead of having to manipulate the coracoid uh, in, the, in the surgical field and identifying it and uh, all of that, you have your distal tibial allograft on the back table. You cut your block. Our blocks are one by two centimeters deep by one, um, sorry, one by two centimeter with a 1.5 centimeter depth. Uh, Ivan Wong has a ViewMedi video. I have a ViewMedi video as well as Bill Levine now from the, as the chairman of Columbia also has a nice video for people that are interested in learning how to do that. So you do this on the back table, there's no subscap split. You go directly over top of the subscap, just lateral to the conjoint tendon. That's where the Halifax portal is. Uh, you sleep well at night and you have uh, really excellent fixation with screws. For me, I'm a big believer that bones like to have screws to have fixation. So that's my personal philosophy. You can see here on the next image, this is what the graft actually looks like. It matches up directly onto the glenoid. We have really you know, great visualization. Uh, you're able to push down and get down low enough as well. You can see the screws here, and that's the subscap that's gonna fold back up over top uh, of this uh, graft as well. So post-op protocol, we get that a lot. You know, what are we gonna do here? Well, you know, when you're using screws for fixation and you're using bone, I'm pretty comfortable. And so, you know, people make fun of me doing burpees in the pack. You we're not going that far, but we do allow these patients to have a sling for comfort for about three days until the regional block wears off. And I allow early unrestricted range of motion. We don't have a lot of physical therapy early on, allow the patient to do it themselves. And then uh, for our collision athletes in particular, where I'm a big fan of ladder J, or I'm sorry, or even this operation uh, with, for the distal tibial allograft, return to sport at three months if there's radiographic union identified by a, by a C scan, CT scan. You know, again, for the sake of a question, uh, I yeah. know my answer, but I want to get yours. Any role for follow-up CT scan at two months, or do you just do uh, serial x-rays? So I would get I would get the CT scan at three months for a collision athlete. If I'm really going to release them, I want to know that, that I'm comfortable that there's been bony union. So we'll do that at three months. And I'm going to present Ivan Wong's data here at two years as well, which is pretty interesting. Uh, you know, again, we have an international crowd. So, uh, you know, I know that some countries, you know, allograft is not a bit, not readily available. So certainly, you know, distal, a distal clavicle graft is a very reasonable option, as is uh, an iliac crest bone graft as well. 
uh, again, you can bring those graphs to the back table using the instrumentation and be able to prepare that graph on the back table to be able to match your defect. So I think there are really good options. So even if, you know, again, uh, allograph is not available, learning this operation, uh, I think really does help your, your, your arrows in your quiver to be able to help patients in a, in a much easier operation than what we've done typically. So here's the arthroscopic anterior anatomic glenoid reconstruction data with distal tibial allograft by Ivan Wong, who was the initial uh, champion of this uh, operation. You can see here to your data, 73 patients, the average age. There were no redislocations in his group, only one subluxation. There were no nerve injuries, and he had full graft union in all patients. You can see the WOSI and DASH scores as, as well here for clinical outcomes measures were significantly improved in these post-operative patients as well. One of the things that, that you know, I'll bring up and then we'll sort of go to questions is that a lot of the times you know, the question is, well, what happens if I put the graft in and it's too big? You know, what's going to happen? Well, the body has a real impressive ability to know what si what's the right size. So you can see some resorption. So you really don't want to oversize the graft. You want to put the graft in that's going to be the right size for that patient. You don't want to have prominent screws with graft resorption and then have to worry about hardware issues as well. So um, that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the case. I'm going to pop out uh, and I guess we can uh, see if there's some questions in the group. Hey, hey Siggy, uh, uh, yeah, where are you? question about the graft. So tell yeah. us more about your parameters for the grafts you'd like to get, because obviously, you know, in the past, you know, there's been data that suggests that, you know, using allografts for this type of surgery hasn't been met with as much success as, as Ivan's showing in his studies. What's different about the graphs now that you're using that is making this more successful? So it's a good question. You know, Ivan, you know, there's not a lot of allograft available in, in Canada. So they've, they ship these patients to Ivan over in Halifax to do all these cases. And the assumption would have been that he's going to be using, you know, fresh frozen graphs because he wants to have the articular cartilage on the graft. And that's what he's going to need to be able to have outcomes. But uh, I'm sorry, fresh graphs. He's He's just using standard frozen allograft. There's no cartilage. It's not, you know, so it's half the price of this of the of the fresh grafts that, that people are spending money on, uh, and that's his data based on those actual you know frozen allograft tissues. Now, what's nice with the distal tibia is if you're on the back table and you're making that graft, you got about three chances to get it right. <laughs> uh, so, yep. so if you make your cuts and it turns out that it's not wide enough, and you're worried about where your screw placement is. Uh, then certainly you can go at it again. One of the little tricks of the trade that I really like about that procedure is that, you know, you want to make sure your graft is going to be low enough. The subscap is going to be pushing you up to try and take you north and you're going to want to push down. So always make sure you have the arm in maximum internal rotation, whether you're using a fancy holder or just a standard holder to release that or relax the subscap. But then also cheat your screws just slightly north into the graft. Mm -hmm. So that way, when you're going in, the screws are going to be in the right position, but you got a little extra graft down south, which is going to match up well to the bottom portion of your glenoid. So those are a couple little tips and pearls that makes it make a difference. Uh, I, I want to just uh, make sure we answer all the questions because uh, I have a few. Um, one question that came from the audience, Siggy, is um, what do you think about the cartilage that's on that DTA? Do you think it's a vi it's viable cartilage or not? That's that's one question that just came up. I don't know if yeah, it's no, relevant, but that was no, it's, it, it's not, vi it's not viable cartilage. Um, it, the reason I like, you know, I like that graft in particular. And the reason it's very popular is the curvature of the graft, right? So you got that natural curvature of the distal tibia, which matches up nicely. So not only are you extending the glenoid track, if you will, but you're also ramping it up slightly, which is also going to help to keep that humeral head at bay. So you know, my experience of only 12 cases so far over, you know, about a, about a year and a half. Any failures point, with those and any I've hardware had, removal? No hardware removal and okay. no failures to date. So I wanted to chime in if you don't mind. So I too am a fan of that actually. Um, and for those of you who still believe in the sling effect, I had a girl who had dislocated 27 times. Um, and so when she came to me, she was workers comp. And by the time she got to me, it was almost a year. And I have the videos. We'll show. Maybe we'll show it in, in September. She had almost fifty percent bone loss. Um, her her it was huge. So I did a DTA and I did hers open because the the graft would have been massive to fit through a portal. It would have been already a mini open. And what I did is actually I went ahead and just um, used the sling. I attached it to the two screws. So essentially, I just teamed a deist. I teamed a deist um, to the two screws. If that makes sense. 
So that's something to think about. If you're really looking for belts and suspenders, I said, well, I've got two screws here. I'm just going to wrap the sutures over the top of the screws and tie it down. So I was able to get a sling effect that way. And you have to remember that Matt Preventure and JT Tokish have been talking about this type of surgical intervention as an open operation, you know, really for quite some time with successful data. Uh, so, so Ivan's contribution to the operation is the arthroscopic side of things is the create is that Halifax portal idea. And look, you know, a lot of these patients that have had multiple dislocations, uh, you have to worry about glenohumeral osteoarthritic change later in their life. And so, yes, it's nice to have a sling effect in, in that process, but it's also nice not to destroy the anatomy that's present by using this type of an allograft. And certainly those screws can be removed, and then you can have a really a much easier approach for a shoulder replacement down the line. Um, one word of advice on the one I did, and I don't know what you guys go through. Um, I do, I, you know, it's, it's a fresh, it's a fresh graft and it, it, it takes a little bit of planning and work and your hospital system will look at you crazy when they get the bill for it, Siggy, as I'm sure you'll know. Um, it does take a lot of planning and I don't know what you go through, Siggy, I'm by nature a little bit neurotic. So I, I demanded to look at all the specs of every graph before they shipped it. And so the case that I had, I mean, God, God bless her. One was a 13 year old that was being donated by her parents. But when, I, when they sent me the pictures, they sent 3D pictures, the company that I use. I noticed when I did my measurements, her physis, her physis were still open, the, the donor, would have been exactly right where I was gonna rotate and put it up. And so I, I turned that one down. So I think the question about the graft, and I don't know, I think you gotta be kind of vigilant about where you're getting it from. And also, you know, the anatomy of that graft. And also, you know, just to make sure it, it meets all the, all, the, all the specifications you're looking for. All good points. Yeah, very good yeah. point. Are you guys doing uh, anything to the capsule after you put your graft in? So, so Ivan Wong, will, and if you look at Ivan's video, Ivan actually grabs the entire capsule and makes the graft extra articular. So he'll put an anchor superior to the most superior screw, one in between the two screws, and then one inferior to the screws. And so what he'll do is he'll release that inferior glenohumeral ligament complex with capsule and put a, a stay stitch into it and then bring it out through, through uh, typically from the, uh, from the D port, just parks it, moves it away, does all of his stuff, and then we'll do a bank cart repair over top. In my personal experience, uh, I usually am a, I'm really happy to get one, um, you know, one anchor in as well. I don't like to extra articular the, the graft. I think the graft is there for a reason to sort of keep everything in place. So I do a little belt and suspender. I grab a single anchor. Typically, it's just south of where uh, the inferior bone screw is. Okay, ready for some rapid fire action, gentlemen? Let's do it. I love this part. Siggy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I feel like this is like a Saturday Night Live Start episode. Laughing. I gotta be careful. <laughs> um, on, in all seriousness, um, if someone comes with an MRI, high quality MRI, either a 3T MR or a direct MR arthrogram, which shows some bone loss, will you send that patient back for a CT? Or do you have some means of which you like to use an MRI by which to assess glenoid bone loss? CT. Amen. CT. Okay. So for me, actually, I've transitioned away from for the sake of the participants. There's uh, out of AJSM, uh, George Atwal and Brett Owens, they had an article in 2015 um, so I, if, you, if you have time, it's estimating glenoid width for instability, a CT evaluation of an MRI formula. So I've actually gotten away from the CT if someone comes with a good quality MRI. Um, what they did is they said that the native glenoid um, width on an MRI should be one third of the height plus 15. So if you get the glenoid height, you take a third of it and add 15, that should be what your native width is. So for the sake of you guys who aren't familiar with it, pull the article. Um, and then when I've gone intraoperatively and I've done R1, R2 ratio, and looked at the bare area and things like that, it actually correlates pretty well. And what, what, the, what Atwal and Owens did is they then correlated the calculations on MR with CT. It was actually very, very, very close. So don't necessarily think if a CT is not a, a, a modality that's either affordable or ready available, you have to, but that's just some article I wanted to make sure I referred you guys to. Oh, that's a good point. So what about the converse? They have a CT, but no MRI. Do you send them for an MRI? So we, we kind of faced that early in one of the presentations. If they don't have any bone, if they don't have appreciable bone loss, I will get an MRI because I would like to look at the, 
at the capsule labral complex, see what's going on, anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament, are you dealing with Alps, are you dealing with haggle, right? Because that still has some soft tissue salvage. But if they have bone loss, I don't really see a need to send them back for an MR. Um, so next question is, and this goes into one of the questions, I believe it was Mr. Stuart Proper asked, what's your approach um, for instability with generalized ligamentous laxity? That was the question. Do you change anything? And I'm going to throw in my part. Would you ever consider doing something for the rotator interval in a situation with generalized ligamentous laxity, multidirectional instability, primarily to the front, though? Siggy. So I'm not going to do anything to the rotator interval anymore. We used to with Dr. Job. That was a lot of fun, but uh, that was about 25 years ago. So the answer is no rotator cuff interval. And I think that, you know, th that's a whole different, that's a whole different lecture. You know, MDI is just a, a very different animal than what we're talking about here with traumatic instability. Okay. Uh, and so you really got to be very careful with these patients, you know, Ehlers-Danlos, what are these other variables that are present for them? Uh, because uh, you may not be happy with your results if you're treating them the same. No, that's a good point. I really slow play them. I'll send them yeah. to therapy for six months before, um, and you really got to dive deep and, and create a relationship with that patient and really understand what they're doing and, and why they feel in, unstable, because a lot of times you're not going to make them better with surgery. Okay. Um, scope in the front for a bank cart anchor placement or scope in the back at time of placement? Amen. Uh, in the back. Same. I'm in the I'm in the back too. I mean, I love that view of from up <clears throat> up in front to be able to verify that things look okay. But I'm super comfortable in the back. Uh, one of the things that we haven't really talked about, which is, I am a huge fan of that posterior inferior glenohumeral ligament complex anchor. At this point, mm -hmm. if I have a patient with anterior shoulder instability, and let's say it's the right shoulder, I'm going I'm going back around to seven 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 thirty, and I'm going to fix that posterior labrum first, and then I'm going to work my way around to the front labrum. A uh, 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 push in or twist uh, anchor for your glenoid. Push in. Uh, push in. Okay. But what material? Ever use peak or you prefer a, a bioabsorbable biomaterial? Bioabsorbable. Bio yeah, bioabsorbable. Okay. All right. Um, any place ever for MR arthrogram or are you good with a high quality three Tesla MRI nowadays? I'm good with a 3T MRI. No more die. They miss half the time. <laughs> yeah very good and so Stuart proper again asked he kind of asked the multi-directional he said can i ask the faculty what they would do with multi-directional instability with a superimposed bank cart lesion so does that does that change your algorithm at all in any way i would say it does yeah if, if they have and especially if their physical exam is consistent with anterior instability and everything speaks to a a bank heart lesion, then yes, I would go ahead and fix the bank heart. But in a multi-directional in, patient with multi-directional instability and no structural pathology on the MRI, I really try to leave those alone. Okay. So, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, if there's a true, the MDI's slow play is a great, light, great way to describe it. But if they do actually have labral pathology and you've slow played them, you can fix it. I have one question from Giovanni Casares. Uh, if you have only one recommendation for a beginner arthroscopic surgeon to improve, what would that recommendation be? Siggy, since you're closest to being a beginner, why don't you answer that? <laughs> <laughs> come, to our, come to our course. Let us teach you. That's right. And, and so one of the latest things that's really out there, and if you listen to the ortho show, I'm going to plug that again there too, would be Danny Goyle for Precision OS. And, uh, you know, I know that, uh, Eamon, you're, you're a big fan as well. But the new virtual reality programs that are available are phenomenal. I mean, you really put, you know, they've teamed up with these gaming companies. So the reality of what you're looking at, you can literally start doing surgical interventions with this technology. And then most importantly is get as many reps as you can, right? Get to these labs, get to places where you can get your hands onto a cadaver and be able to really practice. Practice makes perfect, man. Amen. besides come to the course and hang out with uh, Siggy? Yeah, no, I completely agree. I'd say the, the ability to have um, these kind of virtual reality sessions, uh, whether it's in a headset, uh, like with Precision OS or in a stand-up model, um, that's really the fastest and easiest way to get reps and you know not have to get in for a cadaver lab or anything like that. 
Um, beyond that, it's, you know, you, you start with what you feel comfortable with, knowing that you may, if, it, if you're comfortable doing it open, start with it arthroscopic, get as far as you can go arthroscopic, knowing that you may have to bail out with an open procedure. Um, granted, it's, it's, you know, typically that's the teaching for learning how to do, you know, arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs, where it's a little bit more straightforward because you're just making a little mini open incision where it's a little bit more complicated for an instability patient. Uh, but, you know, start with some of the basic surgical techniques, see how far you can go, see if you can get an anchor in, see if you can pass a suture. Um, and if you, if you feel like you get to the point where you just can't go any further, then don't be afraid to open it. Siggy. Uh, rapid fire Moid Far style. I'm making these questions. 19 year old recreational basketball player in college, first time traumatic bank cart. What do you advise? I'm still not operating on first time dislocators, especially for a basketball player who's not supposed to be a collision athlete. Um, so I would make that patient, I'd probably take that patient through a rehab protocol. Uh, Blink for how then, long? I'm sorry? Blink for uh, how long? Oh, for a day for comfort measures and if, then let him. How go. about if that patient's 15? Uh, the parents, same thing. Parents, th parents think he's going to be the next uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo. <laughs> How tall is he? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 15. What about 15? So I make the parents wear a sling for four weeks and I let the kid out. Okay. There you go. Amen. Yeah. These are tough. And, and we love these rapid fire questions because we try to simplify it as much as we can. But I mean, there are so many things involved in, the, you know, dominant arm. Uh, you know, how, what position is he? How aggressive is he? What is his body style? What are his long-term aspirations? Um, I, I won't say that I never operate on a first-time dislocator. I really try not to. Um, but in this situation, I, I, would, I would agree with Scott. I, I would definitely start with some conservative care. I, I, by the time they get to me, I'm taking them out of the sling because they've already probably been in it for a few days, if not a week or more, and uh, really let them rehab it. Now, that being said, if it's a big ALPSA with a hill sack and you're looking at the MRI and you say to yourself, I mean, I guess the better question is, first time dislocated, are you getting an MRI? Because uh, if, if you're getting that MRI and you see that on there, ALPSA with a hill sacks, you just know that recurrence rate is going to be higher than you want to you believe. I mean, I can tell you in my hands, age 15, um, when, I, when I show in particular some of the West Point data, that, that, that the curve, that the curve, not even the curve, it's linear. Is, is really, a, you know, in the 80s to 90% recurrence um, for instability. And, and then you tell them that if that keeps happening, you you might be um, the next video on Eamon Ferry's uh, uh, AO uh, sports <laughs> conference with a ladder J um, mm -hmm. or a rump massage. Uh, the discussion becomes pretty rapidly goes towards a 25 minute bank card, to be honest. Um, when I start getting into the 20s and 25s, then I start having a little bit more of a discussion 30s, of course not. 40s, and well, it, it, my cutoff as I get older goes up too. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you that that changes. And then in the 50s, you're starting to worry about more about their cuff. But I, I, I'm still a little bit more aggressive. One question that came up from Stuart Proper again, he said, "Do you think that we're re trying to protect the patient from later arthritis, or is the scene set and the damage done at first dislocation with regards to future um, ramifications?" That makes sense, Amen. What's your yeah? Thought I'd say uh, certainly a combination of both. I mean, you know, when the shoulder comes, when the shoulder dislocates, there's obviously trauma to the articular cartilage, and that kind of sets the stage. But uh, obviously, good studies showing that with multiple dislocations, then that risk goes up higher and higher. So uh, for me, you know, what damage is done, we we acknowledge that. But then for me, uh, a lot of this is protecting that joint from further damage. Yeah, that, it's the same thing as an ACL, right? I mean, you know, you get these same injuries that occur, mm -hmm. the knee shifts, it goes out, you get articular cartilage damage, you get, you know, bone marrow edema. And so there's got to be clear injury to that articular cartilage at the time that that happens. And that may set the ball rolling for later osteoarthritis. I like the idea of stabilizing a knee. Uh, and I like the idea of stabilizing a shoulder. And in theory, hopefully that prevents further arthritis down the road. Perfect. All right. I'm going to jump right. in here. I got a couple We're good. closing slides here. All right. So take home messages here, first and foremost, and we've all talked on this. And I think that was awesome. Be sure to properly evaluate your patient. This is a good history, understanding how many dislocations they've had, what do they call instability, get a good physical exam, know where they're dislocating. We talked about imaging and, you know, Scott brought up this really nice point. Get that previous op note. 
that will tell you a lot of information about what was done before, what material is in there, what to expect. That can be very beneficial in planning your revision surgery. Understand why they failed. Was this a recurrent trauma or just a poorly done surgery? So for mine, it was a poorly done surgery. Obviously for Scott's, it was a recurrent trauma. This can help you pick the right surgery. Is there bone loss? We talked about this ad nauseum, glenoid, hill sacs, understand how much bone is lost. Make sure you're comfortable with the imaging studies that tell you what percentage that is, because that'll help you lead, down, lead you down the road to pick the right surgery. And then if there is bone loss, consider bone augmentation, you know, either with distal tibial allograft, latarge, and if there's bone loss on the humeral side, you know, think about that remplissage because when done correctly, these will really decrease that redislocation rate in your patients. So again, uh, if you enjoyed what you've seen in the conversation, we're going to do it again in a month. So please see us then uh, talking about uh, failed rotator cuff repairs, uh, June 15th at eight o'clock Eastern time. And then again, that course, September 24th, 25th, hopefully uh, we can see some of you there in person. So thanks again. Appreciate everybody's time. Uh, Scott and Amir, really appreciate your help on this. This was fantastic. Really enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you guys later. Hey, thank you, everybody.